Hello, thanks. thanks for coming. My name is Szymon Kaliski, and I'm going to talk about Programmable Ink, a research track that I've been a part of at Ink and Switch together with a wide range of collaborators. So to give you a little bit of context, Ink and Switch is an industrial research lab working on digital tools for creators. You might know some of our work focused on local first, like auto merge, or maybe tools for ideation like Muse. And if you're curious, you can learn more about the lab on our website. And I also do have a website, and my background is in research design and development of digital tools. So with that out of the way, this talk is about the year ring to be able to sketch in a dynamic medium, and about a couple of prototypes that we've built at the lab to explore some of our intuitions and some ideas around programmable ink. And before we go there, before we look at some like demos, let's unpack this statement a bit. So first of all, pen and paper is a great tool for externalizing our thoughts. When we think about things, we often do so alongside external material. We often create models of the real world and manipulate them through the paper. Pen and paper makes it possible to sketch at the speed of thought, and through that becomes a partner in thinking. Feynman states this clearly in this interview. His notebooks are not a record of his work, they are the work. And this is how people working in multiple fields already think and communicate with and through paper. They work with external representations of their thoughts. And some people go even further. They create physical models to aid their thinking. So for example, in the upper left corner, you can see Watson and Crick. They didn't just come up with the structure of the DNA in their minds and then use the model to show it. Instead, they used the model to discover it. In the bottom right corner, you can see a hanging model of Sagrada Familia from Gaudi, where optimal arches follow the same shape as hanging chains. So this is basically the basilica upside down. But if we get back to the more familiar pen and paper and focus on this talk, here's another example. A photo from Leibniz's notebooks when he was figuring out notation for calculus. Notice mixed mathematics, notes, sketches, and doodles on the side. Pen and paper is extremely flexible. You can write text, you can draw. There's sometimes a grid, but you don't have to use it. And importantly, you can mix and match these various styles on the same piece of paper without having to stop and switch modes of use, modes of thinking, tools. And importantly, you're not forced to a specific level of precision. You can be as hand wavy or as precise as you need to in a given moment. But with all that we love about it, pen and paper is also static. So the sketches that you make won't respond to you in any way. Fundamentally, there's just no way to do computation on a piece of paper, at least not in a way where it lively responds to you. So imagine drawing an arrangement of wedding tables and the paper nudging you towards possible guest sittings and doing so at the speed of conversation with your partner. Or sketching a design for a bookshelf and parameterizing it on the fly and over time turning this into a reusable tool for your small woodworking business. Or maybe getting intuitions about complex systems by sketching various feedback loops and the paper responding with possible scenarios all while leaving notes and doodles on the side without having to switch modes of views, modes of thinking. We want computation, but we shouldn't have to give up everything that pen and paper gives us to, give to, to get to its advantages. And while pen and paper is static, we recently figured out how to make things dynamic. And as a quick aside, the, the dynamic medium I mentioned here is not this aspirational one of inventing new literacy, which is something we don't have. But what we do have you know, are, are these things. Um, computers are, are this substrate for dynamic mediums I talk about here, one that can compute and lively respond to us. Unfortunately, for the most part, the way we use it is to simulate already existing static media. So for example, if you take this groundbreaking MacPaint application and while it computes in some sense, like consider bucket tool for doing flute fill, for example, I'm going to say something a bit controversial maybe, but I think in an important way, it's as static as pen and paper. Mainly, it doesn't allow you to draw dynamic behaviors. You can't draw wedding, paper, wedding tables and ask the guest uh, for guest sitting arrangements, even, even though a computer could do that. You can't sketch a bookshelf and parameterize it after the fact. You can't simulate any of the properties of the problem that you're thinking about. Finally, 
while the dynamic medium has a lot of great properties to it, it's also often a tyranny of formalisms. We have tools that are made for very precise, pixel-perfect designs, and this makes it easy to fall into this trap of making sure everything aligns nicely, but this is just counterproductive if you're trying to think through things. Remember what it is that we love about pen and paper. It's loss, loose, rough, and immediate. It doesn't force you to work at a specific level of precision. And creating dynamic systems is even worse. We have to leave all the direct manipulation that we can do on the shelf, and we have to start blindly manipulate symbols. So even though in here I can see the results on the left side and they live refresh, this isn't really what you're after in this talk. I'm not manipulating the dynamic system. I'm at best manipulating symbols that become the system. Instead, what I want is to directly manipulate the particles and the code that makes them. The current way of doing things makes sketching impossible. You're always a couple of steps away from the problem at hand. You're thinking in terms of abstract symbols to create dynamic behavior. You're focusing on the technicalities of the tool instead of the problem at hand. There's basically nothing loose or sketchy about this activity. So to quickly reiterate, first of all, pen and paper is a great tool for externalizing our thoughts. We sketch to think about things. But pen and paper is also static. It can't respond to us in any way. We know how to make things that respond to us. We, we have the dynamic medium in some sense of that word, but the dynamic medium doesn't mesh well with sketching. It's formal, it forces specific precision levels, makes you think about the tool, not about the problem. We want the flexibility and sketchiness of paper combined with the power of computation. We want programmable ink. So I think with this introduction, we are all ready to, to go into some live demos uh, of the prototypes that we built at the lab to explore the space and some of our ideas around how we could mesh these things together. And we're going to start with InkBase. This is a project where we kind of early on explored the feel of dynamic pen and paper. So if we switch to my tablet, yes. On the surface level, InkBase is a, is a very crude notebook slash drawing application. So you can, you can draw things, <laughs> you, can, you can select them and remove them. And to show you a little bit more about this, we're going to start with a very prosaic use case. Uh, so I'm, I have a very basic to-do list over here. I need to demo this prototype, finish the talk, and maybe grab some food later. And it would be nice for the system to give me some feedback when I, when I actually did the task. So we're going to build a little checkbox together. So I'm going to start by just drawing a little box. And if I select it, open it up, you can see this inspector pops up and shows you all the properties that this selected ink has. So as I drag it around, you can see the X position, for example, changes. And also on the other side, if I change the X position itself, you can see the box jumps around. So this is the basic of reactivity in the system. What you see on the screen is reflected in these properties, and these properties are reflected back into the screen. So the way to build things in here would be to actually use the, the power of the medium. So a check checkbox looks like that. So for this, we're going to use something that we call spatial queries. It's basically reactively asking the canvas to give us information about itself. So I have this little plus button in the bottom right corner of this inspector pane that I'm going to tap, and that creates a new property. So with this property, we can query if anything overlaps me. And we can see there's a list of, of one object, uh, object 41. <laughs> if I open it up and remove it, this removes the checkbox. This is basically the reactivity happening both ways. And you can see the list is empty now. And as I leave a mark again, there's an object in there again. We can turn this list into a, a Boolean value. So we can say, if the list is not empty, and ask a question about that thing. Now we have a toggle that is turned on, and if I remove this little check mark, it turns off. So to just make the full loop and make that visible to the user, I'm going to find here there's a stroke property somewhere that right now is a constant value, but instead I'm going to make it dynamic, and I'm going to say if that thing that we made on the top is true, then let's be green. 
and otherwise red. So now the box is red, and if I check it, it turns green. This is how we made interactive things in the system. And just to finish out my to-do list, I'm going to duplicate it a couple of times and make a little bit of a mess on the screen. Now just close up all these things and say I'm going to finish the talk soon, so prematurely, let's select this. <laughs> so uh, we basically know that this way of creating dynamic behavior is, is awful, but I wanted to show it to you. <laughs> But I wanted to show it to you so we know it's not magic, right? Like these things actually work, they're just awful to use. But I ask you to focus from now on more on what we can do with these primitives rather than what they necessarily are. So for this, we're going to switch to the next page and we're going to talk about how we can use this prototype to have a conversation about mathematical ideas. So let's imagine I'm speaking with a, with a friend and trying to explain derivatives. Uh, and I'm going to use this example of throwing a ball up. So we have a little ball over here, and I throw it up so it goes up, and then falls down again. And we can, of course, draw a set of axes over here. And if we turn them into real axes, we can chart the position of the ball over time. We can chart the height over time. And we can do, just to see how the derivative of that works like, we're going to make a little delta symbol no, I will screw that up. Yes. So that delta symbol, if we chart this height over time, it will look something like this. And in here below, we get the derivative of that height over time. This is going to be velocity over time. So all of us probably here know that, but we can talk through this example. The velocity starts getting smaller as the time progresses. And in here we have zero crossing where the ball stops moving up and starts going down again. And importantly, we could also look at second derivative of that. So I'm going to make this little symbol again and screw it up again. And now if you squint at this, this is pretty much constant. This is acceleration over time. The ball has constant acceleration as it moves around. Of course, this sketchiness comes from the sketchy input that we have in here. But what's important to notice is this mix of computation, reactivity, and ink on the same canvas on the same page. And while everything that we talked about here is probably familiar to all of you, we can, we can squint and look at another use case uh, that maybe not everyone has thought about. So on this page, oops, in, on this page in the lower right corner, you can see a definition for convolution. And since all of us in here are probably pretty competent abstract symbol manipulators, we can kind of tease out what this does. But what I'm trying to show is, is that sometimes it's easier to just see things and, and play with them. So for this, we're going to create a two set of axes again. Over here and over here. And as you can see, there are two inputs to convolution, f and to g. And I'm going to display results somewhere. So in this system, we've hidden convolution behind, oops, behind a little star. They know how to draw. And this is going to be f over g. So if we say we're working with something that has maybe like a bimodal distribution like this, and for our, our kernel with something like this, you can see that there are two peaks. There are two peaks to this, to this input function, and they, you can kind of see them over here. But if I select this, this little kernel function and start changing the width slowly, just increasing the bounding box width property with my finger, you can see that at some point this, the, these two lamps disappear and there's only one lamp. So the intuition you might get in here is that the result of convolution is how one function is smudged by the other one. And this is pretty much close to what the mathematical definition says. So if we switch to my slides for some conclusions, first of all, we believe that this combination of ink and reactivity shows a very promising glimpse of digital paper. Basically, the, the very high level use of this prototype feels great and, and is what guided future explorations. But we also know that the way to create the dynamic behaviors through textual programming is just not, not a good fit for this sketchy environment. We basically didn't escape the tyranny of formalisms that we talked about. To get anything out of the system, you need to describe the functionality in excruciating details. You often have to drop what you're doing and put on your programmer hat, um, basically focus on the tool, not on the task. 
So the upcoming prototypes I'm going to show you try to solve some of these problems. So let's talk about tinkering and bricolage. CrossCut is another prototype that we built uh, that explores a way to directly manipulate these dynamic behaviors into existence in a way that uh, feels more like tinkering than engineering. So you never have to reach for your programmer hat. So on the surface level, CrossCut is, looks like a vector drawing application. I can, make, I can make some shapes and drag them around. Where it diverges from, from just the vector drawing application is that there's this other ink that I can draw in. We call it meta ink, it's this yellow stuff. For the most part, it, it behaves the same way as the black stuff over here. But the one critical difference is that it holds values. So to show you what I mean by that is I'm going to grab this little number node and connect it to this, this construction. And I'm also going to grab a property picker and grab an X value from this vertex. So now I've connected everything, you can see that there's minus 5.29 on this, on this number node. And as I drag this point around, the numbers change. This is what I mean by values existing on, on Meta Inc. And what becomes even more interesting is I can duplicate this little property picker and grab that value from another vertex. If I connect it together, you can see that whichever of these two points I drag, the bottom one or the top one, the line stays vertical. So this is basically how we enforce, how we make things in this environment. We enforce things to be equal to these meta constructions. And if you squint at this, or maybe if I clean this up a little bit, you can see that we made something that, that might be semi-useful. We made a line that always stays vertical. So in this system, you build things by reusing things that you already have. So I'm going to grab this line and put into another drawing. As I open it up, you can see that this yellow stuff disappeared, but the line still stays vertical. And importantly, I can still snap to it and create little drawings with these two points behaving, hopefully, as we would expect them to. So this is our way of doing core component encapsulation. We hide the implementation detail of this line, but it still behaves as a, as a vertical line. So let's build something more, more useful, more, maybe a little bit more interesting. Uh, we're going to make a little midpoint construction. So this little point has to be between these two other ones as I drag them around. And for this, we can't only make things equal. We need a little bit of, of math. And, and through this part, I'm going to, to run through quickly, just because it's not that super important. But we're going to do a little bit of, of vector math. So we're going to grab an addition node and a division one. Snap them together. And the number over here. So I'm going to add this point and this point. And if you see things snap, jumping on the screen, that's because it's a prototype. So let's turn this into division by two. No, three. Almost. OK, and snap this together. There we go. So now, if you ignore all the prototypal qualities to this, <laughs> to this project, whichever of these three points I, I drag around, so the middle one right now, or the top one, or the bottom one, the construction always stays a midpoint. And we can, again, use this in other drawings. So I'm going to grab four of them this time over here and snap them together like so. And maybe snap the midpoints as well. So now you can see that whatever shape I, ma I make of this encomp encompassing polygon, the polygon that is formed by, by the lines connecting the midpoints always stays parallel. So we can't really call this a mathematical proof of anything, but what we did is we basically tinkered our way into getting an intuitive feel for, for this sort of geometrical problem. And for the last thing in here, while everything we did so far is, is, is very much tied to this geometrical use case, what excites us most about, about the prototype like this is that we can use these spatial primitives to get out of this purely vector drawing-like things. We're going to build one of my favorite demos. We're going to build a little step sequencer. So first thing I'm going to do is grab this LERP line. So LERP is 
like a little bit more generic midpoint. In it, you can specify where this middle point lays. So I'm going to grab this slurp property from this, connect it in here, and make a little slider for myself. So let's grab an X position. And you can see as I drag this top point around, my, my slider that controls the LERP offset, I control where this point ends up between these two other ones. So now make this line straight. And we're going to grab the line that we already made and also snap it together. So now, as I move this point around, you can see it drags this line with it because it has to stay vertical. We're going to also grab a little square to have our quote unquote playhead. And one more trick in the system is that every closed polygon can tell you how many points are inside of it. So as I drag this square over this point, you can see the value changing from zero to one and back again. And we can use this to make a little robot and connect maybe the Y position over here to our drawing. And you can see the sound you have to imagine. <laughs> <laughs> we can see that, that we've made a little step sequencer. And of course, it would be nice if it moved on its own. And I have just a thing. I have a little construction that has a time property on it. And I need to turn it on. And now you can see this still behaves like a prototype, but now we have a working step sequencer that almost makes a sound. <laughs> so what excites us here again is, is this idea that we can use these this basic spatial primitives and construct things that you wouldn't think of necessarily as just geometrical drawings. So for some conclusions, first of all, this reusability of, of simple parts that we just saw has a surprisingly high ceiling. Uh, it's exciting to see how, the, how these simple parts can quickly build up to complex behaviors. With this prototype, we are able to build a lot of ad hoc tools from a custom bookshelf designer to dynamic interactive explanations, everything in between. We also learned that these geometric primitives can be used for building dynamic models. We're excited to see how these special primitives can get us out of purely vector drawing-like things. And additionally, building dynamic behaviors this way feels just distinctively different to how you would program them. In here, instead of manipulating symbols blindly, instead we work with live, visible material and that just feels, feels great. So for the last prototype, in the previous one, we explored what it means to build up these dynamic behaviors by, by tinkering and, and bricolage. In this one, we're going to look at what it means to have a conversation with the material, to have the dynamic medium respond back to you with new ideas. So again, on the surface level, this is just a drawing application. So we can draw things and select them. Oh no. One second. Now we can, and remove them from the canvas. So for the, for the, first, <clears throat> for the first use case, let's, let's imagine a situation in which I'm a teacher, and it's going, uh, getting close to end of the school year. I have a couple of students in my class, and I ask them to write uh, papers on a set of topics, but because I'm a little bit lazy, I don't want to grade them myself. I will assign students to, to grade other students' papers. So I will use this a prototype to basically help me through that thinking process. So first thing I'm going to do is to make a little box where the other student name will go. And what this prototype can do is point arrows at things. So I can put both in that box, or if, and so on. And from here on, we could basically duplicate this box a couple of times, so every student has a place for every other student, like so, and start you know, solving this myself. But that doesn't really use any dynamic properties other than the drawing stuff from, from left to the right. So instead, we're going to start stepping up the abstraction level and, and do progressively more complex things. So first, instead of writing one student into one box, I'm going to grab all of the boxes. So if I select one of them, this little inspector pane pops up, and it gives me some options for 
querying what is on the canvas. So in here, luckily, the first one works for us. It's, it's basically all the boxes on the screen. That's what I want. So if I turn this into a thing we can see on the canvas, this little token, now we have a visual, sorry, representation of the spatial query. So we have a query for all of the boxes. And now we can grab one of the students and pull them into all of the boxes, which is still not what we want, but it's getting us closer. So instead of getting one student into all of the boxes, what we want is to put all of the students into all of the boxes. So I'm going to select a list of student names. And in here again, we have a set of different spatial queries we could run to get to this result. And again, luckily, the first one works for us. It's Bob and everything below him. So I'm going to turn that into a token as well. And now we have a visual representation of my student names and of the boxes. So if I do this, I put all of the students into all of the boxes. As I scroll through the bottom, I can see different permutations of these possible assignments. But with this, we also have a little bit of a problem. You can see that Bob is grading himself, and so is Eve and James and so on, which my students might like, but is not how I want to uh, run through this example. So uh, what we could do is we could just slide on the bottom and find one solution that works for us, or we can tell the system to, to constrain it a little bit more. So I'm going to select one of these cases that I don't like, like Bob grading himself, and find a visual representation. So here is a spatial query for Bob and, and the box next to him. And the more generic one, generic one would be anything on the left and the box on the right. So you can see we get highlights of all the student names and, and the boxes next to them. So I'm going to again turn it into a thing on the page and now use a negation arrow. So tell the system that whatever is on the left can't be on the right. And this is how we get to a, like a first result in here. We see that my students are assigned to each other. We have a bunch of these different assignments. I can print one and, and this is how the grading will go. But imagine a couple of days go by and, and some of the students already start giving papers in and it turns out that like maybe Claire and James row on similar topics. So maybe I want Claire to grade James' paper. So I can add this as an additional constraint on top of everything that's going on and the system will just agree with me and, and retoss all the other, other uh, solutions. And imagine I'm going to this, back to this in a couple of weeks where more papers come in and it turns out that also Steve wrote on a similar topic. So me just thinking quickly about this, I can just point him to the same box, but that obviously doesn't work, right? And it's obvious for us because I just keep talking about this example for like two minutes right now. But if you imagine looking at this every once in a while throughout weeks, maybe it's a simple mistake that you would make. So an important thing to notice in here is that one of these arrows turned red. And this is to us this, this very distinctive difference between how would you use a normal solver which would tell you you're wrong and you see an empty screen versus this thing which tells you we can't do everything that you ask for, but what about this? And actually as you scroll through these different results, you can see different arrows get highlighted red. So we get a bunch of different results with progressively more relaxed question that we ask the system. So finally, let's see how we could scale this up a bit to a, to a, a little bit more complex problem. So in here, imagine I'm running a little coffee shop. I have three baristas, Jim, Amy, and Bob. They are over here. And I have five days on the week, Monday through Friday, when the coffee shop is open. And what I want is to create a little schedule that you can see in, in this corner. I want to assign for every day to have a barista in the in my coffee shop, but also they are not available all, all of the days. They just left the tech check marks when, when they can come in. So first thing that I'm going to do again is here, in here is to find a use, like a first example of, of what we care about. So we care about the situation where we have a name, check mark, and a day of the week. So here I chose James and Monday and, and Jim and Monday, and we have the first query that matches that is this one. It's this very specific one for Jim being available on Monday. But then again, they become more progressively generic. We have Jim available on all of the days, all of the people available on Monday, and here, everyone available on all of the days. So I'm going to grab this one and drag it over here. And now I need to bind this with the schedule in the lower right corner. So I'm going to grab Monday and an empty box. 
and find one that we already saw this, which is uh, whatever on the left and the box on the right, and put this on the screen as well. So now we need to connect together these days of the week. So if the week on the top matches the, week, the, the day of the week on the left, then we have an available person in here, and I will put them in the box. And you can see we have four possible assignments in here. And what is important to notice is that maybe before we started, the, 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 the solution was already on the screen, right? Like there's this availability matrix that you can look at and, and tease out how to align your schedule. But one, to me, this is kind of maybe not obvious always, uh, especially maybe when I'm tired or like have other things going on. And secondly, if the availability keep changing every week or, or, or my baristas have a thing pop up, we can just drag these little check marks around to leave them somewhere else and the system will react. So <clears throat> if we move back to our slides one last time, first of all, with this prototype, we, we came back to this hand round paths, and, and there's just something magical about them. You leave marks on the page, you start getting to some results, and over time build up to complex structures. One interesting observation that we have from using this system is that a lot of problems in the end end up looking like tables, but it just feels much nicer to be able to build up to one over time instead of being forced into one prematurely. This again is this working at the correct level of precision thing. And secondly, the, the fuzziness of the system accommodates well the, the fuzziness of our thinking. So it's not only about the input method and the precision levels. This prototype leans into a very different direction than the usual logic solvers that, that you might be familiar with. Mainly, it doesn't scold at you or for over or under constraining your problem or for unclear thinking about some topic. Instead, it tries to work with you and nudge you towards possible solutions. Again, in this exploratory setting, it's often much nicer to hear what about instead of no. So if you want to learn more about these projects, here are some links to talks and papers in order of how I presented them. Uh, so where are we going? Hopefully the presented demos give a glimpse, maybe a hope for a way to sketch in a dynamic medium. We're after tools that allow you to directly manipulate dynamic systems into existence in a way that doesn't feel like engineering. It's fun to think about this as a bug of the envelope computation. We're after tools that are informal and sketchy that build up on human intuitions and fuzziness instead of trying to turn us into fully logical machines. We're after tools that you can have conversation with that nudge you to think about different solutions instead of scolding at you when you make a mistake. Finally, we're after tools that allow you to fully focus on the task at hand, not on the mechanics that allow you to make things happen. We want programmable ink. So the work I presented today is, is still very early, as you could see. It's, while it's directionally compelling, I think it leaves a lot of open questions. And, and as closing, I wanted to share some of these open questions with you before finishing this talk. So <clears throat> first of all, the, the, these demos show a glimpse of possible future. But how can we truly get there? What is a serious, authentic context of use for these things? And importantly, what can we make to, to fake that and get there sooner? Secondly, no single tool will solve everything, just like there's no single programming language for everything. With paper, you can combine different pens and rulers and compasses. So what is an operating system that supports these tools, and how do they talk with each other? Thirdly, everything that we talked about today works in their own private, maybe platonic microworlds. But we have no idea right now how to position and, and feed these tools alongside existing ones. For example, how could we actually make a sound from this step sequencer that we've built in CrossCut? Or how could I get a CSV spreadsheet of student names and, and solve the paper assignments? And finally, problem solving and ideation uh, are often very collaborative and communal. So how can we make these tools not only coexist with other already existing tools, but also with other already existing people? So with all of that, I wanted to thank you for your time. Uh, feel free to reach out to us or, or to me directly if you, if you prefer that. Um, 
I'm happy to take a question, but we only have one minute, so find me after the talk to, to chat about. Uh, oh, and last thing, I, I wanted to thank all of the collaborators of these projects. This is just not, not only my work. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>